welcome to another great episode of Inside Medical Malpractice. I am so glad you're here today because we're in the middle of a five-part series on some of the most problematic healthcare issues that result in malpractice. The five issues we're going to explore are inadequate patient assessment, medication errors, communication failures, inadequate infection control, and unsafe or improper use of equipment. Each episode will feature a comprehensive, comprehensive discussion on the issue, a medical legal case study or two, and an interview with an attorney and lawyer discussing how they would approach the case. Last month, we tackled the tough topic of assessment with Richard Halpern. It was an awesome episode based on a case study of a maternal death after childbirth. And it's currently the most downloaded episode in the first seven days of any other episode we've ever recorded. It has some great information in it and it offers up the important overall message to never ever get complacent. My guest today is Paul Cahill and the topic, medication errors. Paul's a repeat guest. He recorded three podcasts back in June of 2020. They're all great episodes in which he breaks down a medical malpractice case and the trial that went with it. It's fascinating stuff. I loved recording those episodes. And if you haven't listened to them, please do. Welcome back, Paul. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here again. <laughs> Before we go any further, let me tell you, or perhaps remind you, about what an amazing guy Paul Cahill is. He's been a partner at Will Davidson LLP since 2011. He practices in the area of personal injury with a specific focus on medical malpractice. He has a number of successful trial outcomes over the years with the distinction of winning three in one year, which I think might be the ones that we talked about on the podcast a couple of years ago. He's been recognized by the Law Society of Ontario and is a certified specialist in civil litigation. Paul has successfully litigated both jury and non-jury cases in the Superior Court of Justice, appeared at the Divisional Court and the Court of Appeal, and represented clients at administrative boards and tribunals. He was elected chair of the Medical Malpractice Section of the Ontario Trialers Association from 2019 to 2020, and has served on the board of directors since that time. He assists law students with moot competition. He speaks at conferences, including many of mine, and has authored multiple articles. Paul assists law students with moot competitions. He speaks at conferences, including many of mine, and has authored multiple articles. There's so much more I could say, but Paul is easy to find on the Will Davidson website, where his bio is both comprehensive and a great read. So medication errors. Let's start with a definition. The National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention defines a medication error as a preventable event that may cause or lead to patient harm or inappropriate patient use while the medication is in the control of a patient, a consumer, or a healthcare professional. It's the in control of the healthcare professional that we're going to really focus on today. Medication errors in healthcare are extremely common. I have to say I haven't talked to a lot of doctors or pharmacists about this issue, but I have talked to thousands of nurses about this, and I don't know one who hasn't made a medication error. Well, there's maybe one. I remembered a conference a few years ago where, first, where I asked the whole audience, who in this room, there was 300 nurses, and I said, who in this room has never made a med error? And a young nurse in the very back of the room put her hand up and I said, who are you exactly? And she said, I'm a first year nursing student and I've never given a medication. And I'm like, okay, well, that's probably true. Then you haven't made a medication error. I hardly even know a person who hasn't made a medication error. I mean, who among us hasn't missed a dose of antibiotics or in the case of my sister recently, who has some health issues, she keeps all her medications in a couple of little dose packing things. And she texted last week to say she'd accidentally take all of her nighttime meds in the morning. And then of course she, one, it had a sleeping pill in it and she slept all day. But that doesn't excuse the amount or the outcomes, especially the adverse outcomes of medication errors in healthcare. Luckily, in many cases, medication errors don't cause harm 
even in healthcare. For instance, if, if Tylenol is prescribed or administered instead of aspirin, as long as the patient isn't allergic to whatever they were given, all is well. And I would imagine, in part, due to any lack of a negative consequence or outcome, that many, many errors are never reported. But sometimes medication errors cause serious harm or even death. So their identification and prevention are a major focus in improving patient safety. Some of those initiatives include electronic medical records, computerized pharmacy systems, automatic dispensing cabinets, all of which have been developed specifically with the goal of increasing errors. And they've worked to some extent. In one study at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, there were 116 errors made in a four month period, 72% of which were picked up by the system and picked up soon enough to prevent serious adverse outcomes. And the system caught 100% of substantial dosing errors, meaning something was over prescribed or under prescribed. These are all really good things. But some people would argue that we've just swapped one set of problems for a different one. Computerized systems and the current hybrid of paper electronic documentation and medication delivery have also brought alarm fatigue, equipment failures, system overrides, delayed updating or wrong input of information, while still having the human errors of inattention, wrong prescribing, errors in dosing, and a lack of pharmacological knowledge. Med errors are so pervasive in healthcare that they make up three of the 15 CPSI never events in hospitals. A never event is something that could, should never ever happen in a hospital setting. It's defined as serious. It's defined as likely to recur if it isn't addressed. It's identifiable. It's clearly defined. And key here is it's preventable with the use of organizational checks and balances. If you're interested, you can find a list of all 15 of the NEVER events at the patientsafetyinstitute.ca. Medication errors can happen in a variety of ways, involve a lot of people, multiple systems, lots of problems, and a lot of different scenarios. Problems with medication can start in the research and development stage during production, followed by errors in prescribing, dispensing, and administration. The players can include pharmaceuticals, the companies who produce, the doctors who prescribe, the pharmacist or assistants who dispense, the nurse and other healthcare professionals who administer. But let's start by talking about the 10 basic rights of medi medication administration that if they go as planned, are meant to prevent errors. When I went to nursing school, which was just a wee bit of time ago, like maybe a long time ago, we were taught about the five rights of medication administration, but those have been expanded over time to 10. And I'm gonna run through each one of them because this information is a great review for healthcare professionals, but also good learning for lawyers and the general public. So let's go through them one at a time. Number one seems really basic, but it's be sure you have the right drug. For everyone involved in the dispensive prescribing or administering, to administer the right drug. There are literally thousands of look-alike and sound-alike medication. This issue was just one of the factors in the recent criminal trial of Redonda Vaught, a Tennessee nurse who made a medication error that involved a computer system override and two similar sounding drugs that both started with VE and she gave the wrong drug to a patient that resulted in death. She gave, she gave the drug vircuronium, which is a paralyzing agent, instead of the drug Versed, which is a sedation drug. And the administration of a paralyzing agent in hospitals is one of the absolute 12 never events. But administration of the wrong drug could happen in the inpatient or outpatient setting too. For instance, there was a lawsuit in New York against the Rite Aid drug store a few years ago. The patient was prescribed a muscle relaxant by the doctor, but an antihistamine with a similar name, hydralazine versus hydroxazine, was dispensed by the pharmacist instead. The patient developed seizures, vision loss, and an altered mental state. Point two is be sure you've got the right patient. Healthcare providers are advised to ask the name of the patient 
and check his or her ID band before giving any medication. Even if you know that patient and you know their name. There's a case where two of the same doctor's patients were in a radiology department. The physician showed up to see one of them. He then wrote several medication orders on a blank order sheet and handed it to the unit clerk, who not knowing which of his patients he saw, put it in the wrong chart. And the wrong patient then got all the wrong drugs and suffered some serious injury. Point three is the right dose of each medication. There was a case not too long ago in the hospital where I trained, where a 69 year old man with a chest injury from a horse riding accident attended the ER. His injuries were assessed as painful, but not serious. So the doctor ordered 10 milligrams of morphine and a discharge home. The nurse accidentally injected 10 milligrams of hydromorphone, which is six times more concentrated and typically, typically given in a dose of one to two milligrams. When the error was realized, the man was recalled to the hospital, but he later died. Interesting enough here, and differently from the Redondavat case, a review of this incident found the nurse not to blame due to a multiple series of errors. The nurse was new, the ER was busy, she was distracted, the drug packaging was very similar, the two drugs were stored side by side in the medication room, the front of the packaging had been removed to facilitate the ER drug, crown, drug count, and the exact same error had happened in other hospitals. This is also one of those very specific errors that's one of the never events, but here it is. The next thing is the right route. This is number four. This can be as straightforward as putting your eardrops in your eyes that cause burning and irritation, but it can also have very, very serious consequences, even death. For instance, in the case where an NICU nurse took an antibiotic, which was meant to be injected into the newborn leg muscle and gave it intravenously, causing serious, serious harm. Even though many medications can be given via different routes, for instance, you can take morphine by pills in the mouth, you can inject it into a muscle, you can inject it intravenously directly into a vein, it could come in a patch, but the preparations and the dosages and the frequency of administration deliver, differs considerably and can cause serious harm if it goes in the wrong way. Right time and frequency. <laughs> Giving a drug at the wrong time very often doesn't have disastrous outcomes, but sometimes it does. <laughs> Cases where it's not a problematic is, for instance, if you get, get an antibiotic a little bit late or your thyroid medication late or your blood pressure medication an hour or two late, generally there's no harm. But I reviewed a couple of lawsuits involved post-op patients receiving morphine by a controlled pump that they controlled themselves, patient-controlled anesthesia. In these two cases, there was the right drug, if the drug was at the right dose, it was by the right route, those things were all teed up exactly right, but the PCA pump lockout times were set incorrectly, and the patient was able to just freely inject multiple doses of morphine at any time, just by pushing a little red button that was pinned to the side of the bed. In both of these cases, the error was discovered because they could win, they couldn't wake the patient up in the morning and narcotic antagonists were given. <clears throat> the patient lived, but morphine is a respiratory depressant and it has the well-known potential side effect of, of very slow and sometimes very shallow breathing, which can result in low blood oxygen levels. And in these cases resulted in hypoxic brain injury. Number six, now we're moving into new territory because those five are old, 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 but I've been set straight on this by a couple of young nurses a few times that there are 10. So let's move into number six, which is the right documentation. Each discipline involved in the continuum of medication administration has its own guidelines and rules and regu regulations for documenting. The expectation is that everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do and that they do it. Number seven is having the right patient history and right patient assessment. I have a really great personal example of this one. A few years ago, my mom was in the hospital after a knee replacement and one of her post-op orders included the routine administration of Percocet four times a day. 
after she'd had about three doses, and it was kind of mid-afternoon on the first day post-op, she was just so sleepy and so slow and so confused. So we went out to the nurse's station and said, please hold off the next dose or two of Percocet. She was having no pain, but she was so out of it. And based off on how, based on how she was acting, I said, please just hold off until she wakes up a little. Well, I left the hospital at 10 p.m. Shift change happened and 11 o'clock, she was given another dose of Percocet without any assessment. She got even more confused. She tried to get out of bed on, on her own. She fell hard onto the tile floor where she lay for 45 minutes. She lost three liters of blood and she cut her face and scalp so badly that she had, had to have 38 staples. And she's still struggling with some of the side effects of that injury today. Number eight, and I think this is a really interesting one, recognizing patient autonomy. Number eight is the drug approach and the right to refuse. With a few exceptions, patients are often within their rights to refuse to take medications and or medical care for that matter after a thorough explanation has been offered. And this is even if their refusal could result in death. But this is also assuming that the patient is mentally competent and mature. Think of all their recent business with the COVID vaccine. Or think of a terminal cancer patient who refuses chemotherapy. These are not uncommon scenarios. Some of the exceptions to the right to refuse include a patient in an altered mental state, alcohol, drugs, head injury, psychiatric illness, children. I mean, how many of us have set on a screaming kid, even our own kids, to get them to take a dose of a nasty tasting antibiotic or get a vaccine? and someone who is considered a threat to a community or a physical threat to themselves or others. Number nine is the right drug-drug interaction and evaluation. The wrong two or three drugs can yield a disastrous interaction, as can not assessing weight, ethnicity, age, medical conditions, certain foods, and many, many other factors. There are so many potential drug, drug, and drug disease interactions to be evaluated. And some of them are really weird. For instance, the pain reliever Celebrex can cause an allergic reaction if you're sensitive to sulfa. Some vac vaccines contain small amounts of egg protein and can cause problems for people with egg allergies. A lot of drugs are not meant to be mixed with alcohol. So when they're prescribed to people who drink or aren't taught or educated that they shouldn't take alcohol, they can have some disastrous outcomes. And number 10, last but not least, is the right education and information. Healthcare providers are advised to provide enough knowledge to every patient on the drug that he or she will be taking and, and what is expected of their therapeutic and side effects that they will take them. There's buy-in, they'll buy the drug, they'll get the drug and they'll take it. It's truly an element of informed consent, plus the awareness of how and how often and when to take the drug. Activities like drinking and other foods that should be avoided and potential side effects, both minor and serious. When to stop the drug, when to seek medical attention, expected outcomes, like what problem or condition is this drug supposed to fix or control, and any warnings that are posted. There have been quite a few class action lawsuits involving pharmaceutical companies. In fact, recently, the, well, a few years ago, the company Pfizer settled a class action lawsuit involving a drug used to treat Parkinson's disease. And this was based on a failure to educate and warn patients about the possible side effects of creating an obsession with gambling or sex or shopping. There's been other suits against uh, companies who produce antidepressants that have an increased risk of suicide. Now I'm going to turn this over to Paul, who has six different types of medication error cases that he wants to talk about. These are real cases from this practice, and I think you'll see that every single one of them could have been prevented if these 10 rights were followed. So take it away, Paul, let's hear your stories and we'll stop and ask a couple of questions after each one. Okay, great, thanks, Chris. And thanks for um, all that information, uh, really interesting stuff. And you know what, when you were talking, I was just thinking about you know the different cases that I have in my practice that we're gonna talk about and how each one of them really falls into one of those categories in some way. And that that's really where um, 
you know, where the mistakes happen that give rise to potential civil liability. Um, you know, I, I'm just going to jump right in. So, you know, preparing for today, I, I thought about all the cases I've had over the last almost 20 years and thought about all the drug cases that I've had. And surprisingly, not not a tremendous amount of drug cases. And, you know, just before I get into some case examples, I'll tell you why I think that might be the case. And I don't think it's because there aren't a lot of uh, problems with uh, medication administration. I think that what happens is a lot of the time when it does happen, uh, it doesn't have such a serious adverse effect, just like you're saying Tylenol versus aspirin. I think I think it happens an awful lot, and we can talk about you know some of the reasons why and, and why that might change in the future. But certainly, uh, there are a lot of uh, drug interactions or errors that happen um, that really don't have a huge effect. You know, I, I can think of one uh, just before I get into these. We're at a, a nice um, older lady who is diabetic and took metformin, and the pharmacy accidentally dispensed Tylenol three for her. So she had a wild week taking the Tylenol threes, and you know, survived thankfully, and you know, in the end was okay. But you know, at the end of the day, a case like that, although it's you know actionable, um, you know, sometimes the damages are small. It's just not worth pursuing. Um, and so a lot of a lot of the time, I think uh, you know, these sorts of errors, although they happen, just don't end up being of the magnitude to warrant a lawsuit. Now, the first case I'm going to talk about is a bit different. This is a a 49 year old lady, and this is a a wrong drug kind of uh, case. 49 year old lady who was admitted to hospital for a liver resection for carcinoma. Um, you know, this is a more recent case of mine. Some of the cases I'm going to talk about are, are could be a decade old or, or older. Uh, this lady was hypotensive throughout her surgery. And during the surgery, she received two units of packed red blood cells. Post-operatively in the recovery, uh, she continued to be hypotensive. And it was at that point, and I think, as I recall from the facts, it was a good two hours after going into uh, recovery from the surgery that they discovered that she was receiving an analgesic instead of a, a vasoconstrictor. So she was re receiving uh, bipuvacaine, uh, hydromorphone is best that I can pronounce it, was found to be running centrally instead of level fed, uh, which was actually supposed to treat her low blood pressure. So clearly this was a, um, a drug that she shouldn't have received. And based on her preliminary investigations, the drug she did receive is not a drug anyone should ever receive during a surgery. So it was just a completely wrong drug. Uh, and not only was it the wrong drug that she shouldn't have been receiving, it replaced a drug that she should have been receiving uh, to make sure that her, her, she wasn't ha hypotensive during the procedure. Um, despite discovering the mistake a couple hours after, um, she ultimately passed away. Okay, So it was one of those cases where she spent, I think, about 24, maybe 48 hours uh, deteriorating and then ultimately passed away. And um, it was discovered um, through the investigation that this happened in the in the uh, in the operating room. Question is, why did that happen? And um, you know, the thing with medications and 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 nursing and and being a doctor, you know, we all make mistakes in our jobs. We make mistakes in our life. Um, it just so happens that if you're in an operating room and you pick up the wrong drug, uh, someone can die. And you know, that's unfortunately the reality of things. There is some question as to why that drug was even in the operating room. Um, this case is ongoing and it's at a preliminary stage. So that's kind of all we know right now, but it, it is a question mark. Why was it even there? Uh, why didn't someone check it? Who should have checked it? Uh, you know, was it the nurse? Was it the doctor? Was it both? Why wasn't it checked when she got out of, out of the operating room and was received in another unit? Um, there's a lot of places where uh, it sounds like the system failed. And unfortunately, she was one of those people that just fell through all the cracks um, and uh, had a terrible outcome. No kidding. Man, what a sad story. So uh, one thing that I think is really interesting about this case, I don't know if I'm going to say this exactly right, but I remember in doing some research about medication errors a few years ago, that the perioperative period, meaning from the moment you enter the hospital, and you're pre-op, you're in the operating room and you're in the post anesthetic care unit in the post-op unit, Patients will typically get up to 17 drugs that they've never been exposed to before. And, um, you know, the other complicating factor here is that many people are anesthetized or completely asleep, as was most likely the case, well, 100% the case here. And so you don't have any subjective input from them that they can say, oh, that I feel weird or that hurts or that stings or that, you know, this isn't, this isn't going right. So you are, or, or pain or whatever the issues are. So this is a really high risk time. 
during surgery. And especially for people who really have no input, like this woman who would have been unconscious probably definitely during and maybe even after surgery, she may have never really come around after this and never had the opportunity to give any information like a child wouldn't and um, anybody who's sleeping through these periods. So that's a tough case. How are you gonna, like at the, at the end of the day, you said there was a lot of kind of a systems error, like why was the drug and how was it, why was it given? But when you, when you have the opportunity to question this anesthetist, well, first of all, I guess, like, do you have a thought about where, kid, bad word, but fault, or where the biggest issue in this case lies as far as you're concerned? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the lawyers often look at things differently than healthcare professionals. So what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, especially on the medical malpractice side, honestly, you know, a lot of the times we were looking at what's the, what's the easiest way to get compensation for a client, not easy in, in terms of taking you know, shortcuts or anything, but what's kind of the, the weakest link and where's where, who's most likely to want to settle, who's most likely to blame as opposed to really doing, you know, a full analysis as to, you know, how to prevent this from happening again. I mean, one of the problems with lawyers, one of the many, is we're, we're very backwards looking, right? We're not, you know, as much as, you know, I think lawyers who practice in this area have a strong desire to see a better healthcare system for patients and we're involved in, in you know, advocacy for that. Our day-to-day -day job is looking backwards. We're looking backwards at a problem that happened and trying to figure out who's to blame for it so that our client can get compensation for their losses. And so in a case like this, you know, I'm seeing a lot of different areas where I think there's concern. Um, but the other thing that we also look at is, you know, our our whole specter of, of analysis is based also not just on standard of care issues, but also on causation issues because our clients don't get compensation unless there's a, a causal connection between the breach of the standard of care and the bad outcome. And so sometimes lawyers don't look at non-causative errors as seriously as we look at causative errors. And in fact, sometimes we work backwards and we look at where the cause is, and then we try to look for the errors that relate to that cause. So for instance, in this case, um, although I think there's most likely some issues, not only with the anesthesiologist, maybe with the um, nurses in the operating room, but also in the post anesthesia recovery unit and the ICU doctor that received her, I'm thinking, well, maybe by the time she gets the ICU or starting the recovery, maybe it's a little too late. Maybe at that point, her, her, the die is cast for her. So maybe that's not such an area of concern from a legal perspective because it could be by that point, um, the damage is already done, so to speak. So, um, you know, I'm kind of looking at it not just from from you know where the where the error was, but where it actually caused the most harm to the patient. But I think in this case, it's probably one of those classic cases where there's blame to go around, um, and you're probably looking at everyone. Uh, discoveries haven't been done, so you know we'll have a probably one of these cases where it's like three or four days of discovery, and we're examining um, you know multiple doctors uh, and getting lots of evidence to see um, exactly what happened. Well, to be fair to you backwards looking lawyers, I think that, um, you know, when you understand exactly what you said, that your job is not necessarily to find the system errors and change them, but it's to get compensation for your injured patients, that it kind of makes sense that you look at it differently than healthcare does, you know, not working in the system. Although all of us as healthcare consumers have a vested interest in seeing things get better. And when stuff like this happens, you're like, please don't let that happen to me. So how are you going to question the anesthetist in this case, the person who gave the wrong medication? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, there's sort of two elements to it. We know that the wrong medication was given, so we'll be asking why did that happen. But as a lawyer, you're going to want to go a little bit deeper, and you'd be asking, you know, this patient during the surgery was, you know, persistently hypotensive. What were you – and you know in the anesthesiology records it has a little – like um, chart and it shows above the graph. And so you can follow along every 10, 15 minutes, whatever the interval is. And you can say, okay, she's hypotensive here. She's hypotensive here. What, what were you thinking? What were you doing? And the examination would be along those lines of, you know, okay, we know that there was a medication error that you discovered after the fact, but why weren't you al alive to it during the surgery when this patient was abnormally presenting during the surgery? And what were you doing? Were you double checking the medication, trying to find a reason for why she was hypotensive? Uh, or did you just try to treat the hypotension with whatever volume or whatever it is that they did, um, hoping they would go away without digging a little bit deeper? Because you kind of want, I think, you know, in, in these cases in the legal side, you know, we want to understand there's there's a 
there's a story behind it. You know, why did this happen? We know what happened, but why? Was it because someone was careless? Was it because someone was having a bad day? Was it because someone wasn't um, educated enough or knowledgeable enough or that there weren't systems in place to help them? We need to understand the why to get to, I think, um, appreciating what happened you know, from a legal sense. So another question for you on this case, my understanding is that many death cases don't translate into viable malpractice lawsuits. What was it about this particular case that convinced you to take it on? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the problems with 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 fatality cases from a from a legal perspective is the potential value. Um, if someone doesn't is not an income earner with dependents, the potential value of the case can sometimes be somewhat limited, uh, as opposed to someone who survives fortunately but is left with profound disability that requires extensive care those are no doubt the most highest value of cases and so you know strictly speaking if you're going to be pursuing a case and on a contingency fee basis like pretty much all of us do uh, and the amount of work that's involved uh, in opposition and risk you you want to make sure that it's worthwhile um, and that gets worse uh, as the patient gets older and sometimes younger too sadly so um, you know, if you have someone in their 80s or 90s, um, so, sometimes the damage, uh, potential damage awards are so so small that, you know, a lot of lawyers, even with what seems to be a very strong liability case, may just say, no, thank you. I have, you know, always in my practice allocated a certain amount of my energy towards what I think is just a, a just cause, which is just a case that I think something went wrong. There has to be accountability for it. If it's only worth $100,000, it's only worth $100,000. I don't really care. Um, because I think to let it go is, I can't sleep at night. And so, you know, I think this case is is probably an, an okay case in terms of the, the, the value, but it, it wouldn't have prevented me even if the person was 90 years old. Clearly there was a mistake here. Clearly someone died as a result. Uh, there needs to be accountability for it. And even if it ends up not being a huge amount of money, I sleep better at night knowing that they had a, a chance to have their voice heard and get some compensation for what happened. Hmm, nice. I mean, th thank you for that. Thank you for taking on those cases that can make a difference. I try. I do try. Sometimes I regret it, I'll be honest, but some of the times it makes me very happy. So <laughs> So you, <clears throat> you mentioned um, when we were talking or prepping for this podcast that you had another couple of comments about the wrong drug with no specific examples. Um, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think the wrong drug seems to be the most common sort of case that you, that you see is it just, oops, I gave you the wrong drug. Uh, and uh, yeah, we see it, we tend to see it uh, all the time. But I think the comment I was making was, it just doesn't always translate into like a real lawsuit. Um, it, it, you know, it, it just, because it's, I mean, obviously the people have allergies or they're in a situation where they need a particular drug to save their life or they're in such a state that the wrong drug will kill them. But I think a lot of the times, you know, getting the wrong drug, it's not going to, you know, if it's just once, you know, or for three, whatever it is, it might make you feel sick or whatever, but it's not going to kill you. And it may not even give you any lasting permanent damage. So it just doesn't turn into a, a lawsuit. Um, it definitely could be something someone might complain to the hospital about, to a regulatory body for the physician or a nurse or whatever, and that may result in some kind of disciplinary action, potentially. Um, or it might just be like, oh, I'm lucky I didn't get killed in the hospital. And, I'm, you know, you know, we all know how dangerous hospitals are. And, you know, if this is the worst that happened to me, then, you know, maybe I'm lucky. And people just get on with their lives. Well, I'll tell you, as, as a nurse who's made some medication errors, luckily never anything harmful, but I've certainly made errors in my career. Um, and luckily, I'm also not a patient very often. But when I am, I never let any, like if there's someone comes in to hang something in my IV bag or give me a little. You're like, what's that? Oh, yeah, oh, my God. Oh, my God. A, a little white container full of three or four pills. I'm like no way let's just break this down one by one and i'm so suspicious but i think i might be like that anyway but i'm well aware of the errors and that's just accepting the fact and we'll try to talk about this a little tiny bit at the end you know as healthcare consumers how, how can we protect ourselves you know knowing that these errors are out there there's responsibility on everybody but certainly as healthcare consumers you know to protect yourself so you also mentioned as part of the wrong drug thing um, which is maybe also in the wrong information department, 
that there's conformed consent issues sometimes if the risks and benefits of the, of the drugs are not properly are not mm-hmm. properly explained before they're prescribed. From a le- from a legal perspective, um, perhaps you have examples of those cases, but what are you looking for in a case that involves a lack of informed consent? What would you be looking for in the documentation that would convince you that would say, no, no, this patient was informed or client was informed of everything they needed to know? Yeah, so I, I think informed consent cases, they're different. They're different legally than a negligence case. I mean, it's a type of negligence. But the the the, the, the idea of it is that the particular drug that the person took, they would not have taken it had they been aware, uh, had they been properly made aware of the risks. And it's really a two-part analysis. It's a subjective, objective one. So the subjective side of it is that particular person has to say, had I known that if I took this drug, there is a risk of uh, arrhythmia and I could have had a heart attack and died. And and, it, I di- and you never told me that there is that 1% chance risk. And I wasn't going to take that drug if I knew that that was the case. There also has to be an objective side to it. And the objective side is that no, re- no reasonable person would take that drug either. And I think when you're looking at you know informed consent cases with drugs, really you're looking at the, the, the pros versus the cons. How much is this drug going to help the person versus how much is it potentially going to hurt them? And in a case where there isn't a lot of helpfulness to the drug, but there's a lot of potential bad things, those are the types of drugs that are you know more likely going to be successful on an informed consent case. I always, you know, in my practice, you know, you know, you have informed consent cases where people are like, well, I wouldn't have, you know, I didn't want to, you know, something bad happened. I wasn't explained all the risks. And it's like, well, what happened? Well, I had to have, you know, chemotherapy and radiation therapy for cancer. And I wasn't told about all these things. And, you know, often the reaction is, well, I think you probably were going to do it anyways, because, you know, it, you didn't have much of a choice. And when you're, when a patient is faced with a particular drug option that is going to potentially save their life or limb, um, and, but uh, something bad happens afterwards and they're, they weren't fully informed of all the risks, it's hard to formulate a case where um, there's an informed consent case because probably they would have taken it anyways. But if it's, a, if it's an elective, uh, and I think a lot of like the, you know, a lot of what's happening with you know, plastic surgery, dermatology, all of that great stuff that's out there and everyone's enjoying, it's purely, you know, I say elective, it's purely, you know, discretionary. You don't need this. And so, you know, if there are certain drugs in that sphere that are potentially harmful and you're not told, well, then you have a pretty gar- good argument to say, well, hey, I wouldn't have done that if I had known. But I think for the drugs that are, um, you know, important to saving people's lives or, or improving their quality of life, um, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, you know what I find kind of interesting is pharmacists and pharmacies have taken a very active role in not consent, but in giving information. I mean, now when you go to Shoppers Drug Mart or anywhere, you get a two-page handout for every medication you take. Even stuff you've been on for, you know, I have a couple of things of like a thyroid pill I've been on since I was 27 and I still get the whole thing. But I was reading through it the other day just for fun, you know, as I was prepping for this podcast and it was interesting. They give all the risks and the benefits and the potential side effects and interactions and don't do this and take it with this without food, and, you know, stuff. But then at the end of it, it says, um, it is important that you finish all of this medication because your doctor has determined that the uh, any risk associated with this medication outweigh no, that the benefits, sorry, the benefits associated with this medication outweigh any potential risks. And I was like, you know, I mean, I, I kind of, that kind of took me back because I'm like, A, that's my decision to make, I would think, you know, not the doctor's decision to make. And I don't actually remember ever in my time being on Synthroid, ever having a conversation with my doctor about the risks and benefits, ever. So I thought it was interesting that the information was all there, but then it said, take it all and take it till it's done because your doctor has decided. So I said, um, we're all in a flux and everybody's trying to do something to help but it's interesting that the so many errors are still happening you know really interesting well i mean even on that you know that kind of self-serving language at the bottom of that prescription summary whatever you get i mean you know the informed consents you get when you do a surgery you sign the consent says my doctor explained to me all the risks and benefits and i agree to them and then you sign it but they're not actually listed on the consent typically that you just signed and just like in in life, in anything, and if if you did take a medication and you 
you know, had an adverse event and you said, hey, wait a second, I didn't know that could have happened. And had I known that you know, there's that risk, I, I, I would never have taken it. And you, you raise an issue and you bring a lawsuit, um, you know, your doctor's going to say, well, I told you. I told you all that. It might not be documented. You know, we talk about documentation. It might not be documented, but, you know, I, I told you all the risks. And they'll tell you that they did because that's their usual practice. They do that every time. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Well, I'll tell you, like, the stuff that's not listed but often said at the bedside. I've stood at the bedside of a doctor consenting a patient for surgery thousands of times. And they often do really quickly go through the risk of this procedure, included, you know, bleeding, um, infection, um, you know, problems during surgery, and blah, 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 including death, including death. You know, they'll say those words really quickly. It's a little bit routine, but the patient 99.9% .9 of the time will just still sign the consent. So I don't know if, I mean, I mean, the good news is things almost always turn out right or often turn out right, unless I talk to someone like you who knows otherwise, certainly, or sees otherwise. So it's all kind of interesting. Well, let's move on to the next case. You have a wrong drug dose case involving a 13-month-old boy. Why don't you tell us about that case? Yeah, that, that case was uh, an older case that I, I dug up getting ready for today. And this was a 13-month-old boy who was admitted to hospital with a diagnosis of croup. And as part of the standard treatment for croup, he was prescribed nebulized epinephrine to help with his breathing. And the the physician ordered 0.5 cc's of nebulized epinephrine. Interesting on the facts of the case, the nurse pushed back on it. We know that the nurse did because in the order sheet, um, there's a note saying, call doctor to double to check dosage or something like that, and then confirmed that it was 0.5 cc's. Um, what, what, was, what ended up happening is the child's condition worsened. He was at a community hospital and ultimately got transferred to a tertiary care pediatric hospital uh, where he was intubated and, and stayed for 10 days and um, was ultimately let go and actually made a pretty good recovery. This would be one of my one of my cases that I took uh, out of principle more than out of financial gain of any kind. Uh, so the kid made a fairly good recovery, but nevertheless, very traumatic event for the whole family. And um, it was determined and discovered that there was a, a, a dosing error in terms of the nebulized epinephrine. And what it was, was there, there had been a change in the formulation of the drug. And it was something that the pharmacy, that, that the hospital was aware of, but didn't quite um, get it out to the physicians and, and nurses involved. And I don't know all the details about you know, formulation of, of drugs and stuff, but the gist of it was that the proper formulation for what they had intended to give the, the, the child was five millimeters uh, of uh, one in 1,000 1, of nebulized epinephrine. And they discovered all this afterwards. So basically, the kid got one-tenth or so of the dosage that he should have received, which probably explained why uh, his condition deteriorated to the point that he required intubation. Uh, and transfer. Although, you know, one of the challenges in this case is that treatment is more of a symptomatic treatment, not really curative. So um, it was one of those cases where I think there was a medication administration error, uh, but the damages were challenging um, at the end of the day. Yeah. So, so really suboptimal dosing here. So wrong dose. And it's kind of interesting because many of these cases seem to involve overdose, but this is a suboptimal dose or way too, like a tenth of the dosing as you described. Mm -hmm. um, so who, like who are the defendants in this case? So th there's the physician ordering, there's the nurse who pushed back but gave, there's a pharmacy who administered, there's a hospital who didn't communicate the change in the formulation. Who are the defendants and how did you approach it, this case? So the, all the, def the defendants were the pediatricians that um, admitted the child and, and saw him during the stay in the community hospital for about three or four days. Um, as you know, there's all these shift changes in hospitals, which you know make prosecuting these claims difficult because you have a different pediatrician on every 12 hours or 24 hours. Um, and then sometimes depending on the hospital, the physician may have a resident or a fellow uh, who's also assisting on the case. You might have two different doctors sort of involved in a case uh, at a particular time, and then you add three days, you're looking at five or six doctors, literally. Uh, so they were all involved. Um, and then and then you have like the admitting doctor, and then we have to, you're gonna include the doctors that you know saw the patient through the emergency room as they came in. Um, and then the nurses, you know, 
nurses are generally vicariously, or the hospitals are vicari vicariously liable for the nurses. So, so, you know, some lawyers may want to include every single nurse, and then you have that same issue where you have five or six nurses potentially involved. Some lawyers, including myself, may be selective on the, the number of nurses that we uh, name and include in a lawsuit just because of the, the you know, having to examine all of them uh, can be a lot of work and maybe not worth it, but the nurses were involved. And then the hospital itself, the pharmacy, uh, was ultimately involved in this case. The outcome of this case, and it's an older case, it, it did resolve, not for a, a large sum, and ultimately it was one where um, there were challenges getting contribution from the physicians, right? Because they ultimately pushed the blame onto the hospital and the nurses. Um, in fact, it was one of those cases where the, you know, the physician was saying something along the lines of, yeah, when that nurse called to correct the order, I actually corrected it, but she got it wrong. Uh, for the second time. So it was one of those where, you know, the nurses kind of got thrown under the bus. But I, I think at the end of the day, it was a hospital issue anyway. I mean, whenever you have, um, you know, uh, drugs being um, prescribed at a dosage that's not within normal a normal range, uh, that should trigger some kind of flag. That mm. So as a, well, I feel bad about that. I think that goes back to documentation again, too. You know, when the doctor said I told her the right order and she got it wrong a second time, you know, if the nurse had documented some important element of that conversation, things might have gone better for her, to, gone differently from her. That's a good lesson for everybody listening in. But um, thinking as a, not as a backwards thinking lawyer, but a forward thinking consumer of healthcare with a family, how should this have gone in your mind? I think that that it ultimately the hospital pharmacy should be checking dosages um, before give, handing the drugs out, and if there was something offside of it, that should have been picked up. So I, I think this is one that would have been prevented uh, by the hospital pharmacy. I mean, you can say, well, the doctor should have been up to date because I, I remember reading about it at the time. At the time, and there was a change in the formulation of this particular drug, like in the two or three years before. So I was a little surprised. Well, wait, I had you know, no one's prescribed this drug in the last two or three years to know there's a change, and the doctors obviously need to stay up to date in terms of prescribing and drugs and all this kind of stuff. And in reality, I think it's still a hospital thing um, that should have been. And what's your line of questioning for? a doctor or a nurse who said, I, I didn't know. I didn't know this had changed. No one told me this had changed. Yeah, usually that's, I don't ask any more questions. I'm case oh. closed. I mean, you should know. <laughs> oh, you should know. Yeah, you should know. I mean, of course you should know. I mean, I mean, saying I don't know isn't, isn't a defense. It's an explanation for why, you know, you were negligent. Uh, I didn't know. Um, I mean, you could say, well, why didn't you know? Well, I didn't know because I didn't teach myself or I didn't bother to ask or I just assumed or whatever the explanation is. But if at the end of the day, the the evidence of the witness is, I just, you know, was unaware that this was incorrect, from, from my perspective, that's pretty conclusive of, of medical negligence. It really speaks to, well, I guess, a lack of pharmacolo pharmacological knowledge, which is a factor in many of these cases. And I guess also to the responsibility of each healthcare professional to maintain their own competence and education, regardless or in spite of and outside of what they're taught with the employer, which is a challenge, you know, we're all going to say, but it's an important, important, important basic thing that healthcare providers are tasked with. So we've got another one here, um, which is the wrong route story. Tell us that story. Yeah, so this was one I was retained on um, about seven, eight years ago, and it was a, a family physician who was 66 years old, and he'd suffered an ankle fracture in his home and taken to hospital. And it was determined that he needed to have surgery uh, to, for his fracture, and uh, the, the uh, orthopedic surgeon was of the view that it should be done quickly. The patient was um, on long-time anticoagulation therapy for, for deep vein thrombosis, and it was determined that he needed to have that reversed to go into surgery to avoid bleeding. And so he was ordered vitamin K, which reverses the anticoagulation. And as I recall, um, the order for vitamin K, I don't recall, but I kind of think it just said vitamin K was the order. And so he was given vitamin K uh, orally, and... Um, I think, you know, it, it happened in the evening and then the next morning he was taken into surgery. 
and his INR had not really come down, and he bled a lot. And so the intention of the orthopedic surgeon going into the surgery was to do a normal open reduction internal fixation with plates and screws. But when the bleeding started to happen, I think he was like, oh, we better deal with this more quickly. And he did something called a rush rod, which is not the ideal way to fix a fracture like this. And, and the patient ended up with quite significant disability as a result of that um, choice of uh, fixing the fracture, uh, which in part was due to not properly reversing the anticoagulation. And the plaintiff uh, patient was a physician himself, very knowledgeable. Um, and, you know, I've, I've represented physicians over the years, and I always kind of love it and hate it at the same time. I love it because I get to, you know, really get in deep with the medicine with them and understand the medical issues. And, you know, this patient in particular was doing medical research for me. And, it, you know, it was a really great, uh, but it can also be challenging because, um, you know, they can get fixated on issues that, you know, from a legal perspective are, are less important. So, you know, sort of at large was, there are a lot of things going on here, but in terms of, you know, the, the, the surgery itself and a whole bunch of things, but the fixation was definitely on the root of, of vitamin K. That was a, a very, very significant sore point for my client who was, just out of his mind that they would ever give it to him by mouth. Like it should have been IV. It should have been IV. If it had been by IV, it wouldn't, wouldn't have had this problem. Um, you know, interesting, they didn't check his INR again too, right? So obviously some, they weren't, you know, really thinking about the anticoagulation because they probably should have checked it again before they brought him to the operating room. But he, he you know, it was so important to him and we did all kinds of research on it. And, um, you know, ultimately it was, um, it was resolved in, in a way that was satisfactory to everyone. But, uh, I do remember this case very, very vividly and having lots and lots of conversations about, you know, why, you know, vitamin K by IV is better than by mouth and what's in your stomach at the time. It's fat soluble if you do it by mouth and it doesn't work and all this kind of stuff. And a uh, really interesting case. Um, but this one probably, you know, jumps out to me as the, the, the biggest case example I have of like the wrong route of medication. Right. So you say you say route and I say route. That's probably an American Canadian thing. I'm not really sure, but we're both talking about the same thing. Right. I've seen a couple of these cases too in um, you know sort of my career of nursing and as doing some legal work. Um, and sometimes these have disastrous outcomes. You know when the the INR is out of whack and the clotting isn't stabilized before someone goes into surgery, especially for someone who's been on long term anticoagulation therapy you know, and there's strokes and bleeding to death and all sorts of things that happen. So um, a question about this, was this a prescribing error by the physician? Was this a dispensary error by the pharmacist or pharmacy staff? Was this a systems error, something like a, you know, a click in an erroneous drop-down, an erroneous click in a drop-down menu, a transcription error by the unit clerk or nurse, or was this an administration error by the nurse who gave the vitamin K? I'd have to double check the records, but I know that in this particular case, the claim was only against the physician and, and resolved on that basis. So um, I think it was a, a, a prescribing error. So I think it was the ordering physician that was not clear as, term, as, as to the method uh, or had said or, orally um, and, or not IV, but I kind of think the physician maybe wasn't so specific about it. And then it was just assumed to be orally. Um, and, and then that's what happened. But you know, this is a case that you wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't see the pharmacy gang involved in a case like this. Why would they care? Okay, doctor orders vitamin K. I mean, they're not gonna say, oh, that's, it should be IV instead of, you know, or like a pharmacy wouldn't, I don't think have any say in something like that because it's, you know, that's clinical judgment based on the case and they don't have those details. I would think. Yeah, that's, that's true. Unless it was, um, and there's so many doctor's orders where the, you know, the writing is very, very problematic. And so someone who can't quite read or understand the the route or the route, however we're going to say this, of how this should have been given. Um, you know, and it's interesting. I, I've worked with a lot of nurses who are maybe afraid or reluctant to question doctors when a medical order for, medic uh, for medications is barely readable. And in every hospital I've worked at, there's been a couple of nurses who really prided themselves on being able to decipher a really difficult doctor's writing. But I really wonder too, how often 
you know, um, it's just you can't read the order how often that how often that, you know, results and contributes to this. And when someone just doesn't question it, whether it's the pharmacist or the nurse or the unit clerk or whoever, when someone doesn't question the readability of the doctor's the doctor's orders, it's all that's going to change, though, right? With electronic um, medical records, I mean, so many hospitals have changed. It's it's rare now to see handwritten orders. Um, I mean, they're still out there. I still see them, but it's you know now you get the you know, twenty thousand page printout of their computer system when you get a hospital chart for someone, um, and it's really hard to read. Um, but yeah, everything's electronic, so there now there's you know now there's no issue. There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be. But you know, I've seen cases where the computer system's been down for 24 hours or something's happened. And, or the drop down menus, it's easy to make a, a click mistake on a drop down menu. It's easy. Like when you're sending an email and you absolutely click on the wrong name with someone with the first, same first initial or whatever. I've almost sent you a couple emails and then thought, whoops, nope, that's my sister Penny. It's meant to go to Penny, not Paul, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, so there's still, there's still, still room for error there, but, um, you know, hopefully the combination of everything that's being done over time and, you know, patient education and system changes and nursing and doctor and pharmacy education. Okay, well, that was a really good case, um, the right route or route, however we're going to say it. So you've got another case about the wrong time and frequency, a drug instruction or information error. Yeah, and this this is a um, this is a pharmacy case. So in this in this particular case, this seventy six year old lady was prescribed uh, K-exalate, which is um, sodium polystyrene sulfonate, basically to treat uh, hyperkalemia, I believe. And she was told to take it uh, three times a week uh, for four weeks by her doctor. When she took the prescription to the pharmacy, they told her to take it three times a day uh, for four weeks instead of three times a week. And so she did it as uh, ordered and ended up uh, becoming severely hypokalemic and had a stay in hospital and some other issues. And I ended up having a stroke. So, you know, in this case, we're trying to assess the causal connection between the stroke and the hypokalemia, um, which um, I think is, is a potential issue. Uh, but, you know, this was sort of a classic example of, you know, a mistake. I mean, it was 100% a mistake. It was... You know, I think there was an investigation done um, at one of the colleges, and it was it was determined that you know the pharmacist just made a mistake, you know, and, and there you go, and um, that's that's what happened. Well, you're absolutely right. The hypokalemia or low potassium can result in it's exact reverse of the case that we just talked about, where the potassium when the pot potassium is too high, potassium is one of the, like the four electrolytes with sodium, potassium, calcium, and there's another one in there, which I'm forgetting right now. But when it's too high, it can cause cardiac arrest, do some electrical dysfunction. When it's too low, it, it alters the, blood, the blood's ability to clot. So you can bleed too much. Vitamin K is actually given to newborns in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes after they're born because they've got that huge juicy umbilical cord with those big blood vessels in it that are at risk for bleeding. And because I've never had any dietary intake you know, to uh, at the moment that they're born, they don't have, they have suboptimal vitamin K levels or hypokalemia, which is what you just described. So you're absolutely right in this case, that's what happened. She was at risk for bleeding and that's likely, possibly, why she had the stroke or certainly a contributing factor. So this wasn't, you said, a prescribing error by the physician, but it was a dispensary error by the pharmacist or pharmacy department staff, correct? Correct, yeah. And it wasn't at the hospital pharmacy. This was, I think, at her local, her local pharmacy um, that, that just made a mistake somehow. So you've got the next one. You've got right monitoring or assessment. Yeah. So this is this was one that I, you know, was found really interesting. It was a case I did a, a number of years ago, and it was a case I, I co-counseled with uh, an older lawyer who was re reaching retirement age, and he, he he didn't do a lot of medical malpractice, but he did a little, and um, I knew he had a good case, but needed a little bit of assistance. And what he had was uh, a 55-year-old lady who was prescribed gentamicin um, as an outpatient due to a, a pyelonephritis. So I think she had an allergy 
uh, to other antibiotics, which is why she was given gentamicin, which is a very powerful antibiotic and also has a, a somewhat narrow therapeutic range and can be dangerous for patients because of its tendency for autotoxicity and uh, vestibular toxicity, uh, nephrotoxicity. So it, it has the, the potential to get into a toxic level um, quickly, uh, you know, if it's not properly monitored. So as a starting point, you know, some of the information I remember getting back in this case was, you know, this is a pretty, you know, risque drug to give to someone as an outpatient for starters, because you can't see them in hospital. Um, I mean, she, she had, um, you know, the community nurses coming and it was administered by IV. So someone came every day to administer it to her. And I think she got it for a good while, like a good 10 days, and then went to her family doc who topped her up for another six. And he kind of got the hot potato because I don't think, because she got it through the hospital and um, was discharged and had this set up. And I don't think the family doc really knew what was going on until she, you know, someone came to him and said, hey, can you give her some more? And he said, okay, sure. Uh, what he didn't know and what, you know, wasn't set up for her when she left the hospital was any kind of monitoring. So someone with this kind of uh, antibiotic needs to be monitored on a regular basis. They need to get have their blood levels checked um, to ensure that they're not getting into that toxic range because it can sometimes start happening before there's any symptoms. And you know, by the time they're they're symptomatic, if they can't, if they have dizziness and nauseous and they can't walk, um, you know, probably too late at that point. So. Um, there were a whole number of potential defendants in this case. We had the emergency room doc who basically, you know, diagnosed this uh, kidney infection and prescribed this drug and sent this lady out of the emergency room um, without, you know, good monitoring in place. I remember there was some issue with the the hospital pharmacy itself um, was kind of implicated in terms of even allowing this to happen. Uh, and then you have the community nurses and the, the the pharmacy that supplied the drug not really catching on. And then the family doc who got dragged in at the tail end uh, with a top up without really realizing, you know, this lady was getting this really strong antibiotic that had a real potential for toxicity and no one was, was checking her uh, to make sure that that wasn't happening. The lady unfortunately ended up with chronic um, um, dizziness so bad that she basically couldn't walk. So, um, you know, you can imagine uh, that kind of life. I mean, it's just awful. So very, 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 very bad outcome. For the non-medical audience, when you talk about autotoxicity, that can lead to deafness and the vestibular toxicity, which you described is, is dizziness. And the renal toxicity would be kidney failure. <laughs> and, um, you know, so, okay. So how the heck did this go so wrong? What? Where, like, what did your experts have to say about how this should have gone, standard of care issues? And um, how and where did this big breakdown happen that nobody ordered any kind of follow-up? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I had an infectious disease doctor on from the start, and he kept talking about it as being, you know, the Swiss cheese model of error. And he actually had a diagram of Swiss cheese, and you have the holes that go through the cheese. And somehow... Someone just gets right through all the holes. And that's kind of what happened to this lady is, um, you know, probably um, probably she should have stayed in hospital to begin with if they were gonna give her gentamicin, at least for a few days. Um, that would have at least set up the proper monitoring in place and she would have been in a better uh, setup for that. Um, if, if they were gonna give her gentamicin in the community, um, you know, the, the nurses and the, and the pharmacy that supplied the, the gentamicin should have been aware of the monitoring requirements and ensured that they're in place before they started administering it. Um, but even, even at that, even the community, like it's, you know how, how hard it is when someone's out of the hospital. Like, so what are you going to do? Tell her to go to a lab and get her blood checked. And then what's going to happen with that? The results is going to go to the busy doctor. He's going to check to see if the creatinine has gone up or whatever. And he's going to call her and tell her to come in. Like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> like, I mean, you want it to happen, but and maybe it would, but we know the reality is once someone's out and if they're getting their blood checked, there's going to be a pretty big lapse in terms of any kind of reaction, unless there's something really, really off and someone's paying attention. Um, so I, I think that's that's the other issue. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the, the the family doc who got pulled in at the end, you know, got told, I don't know, but by the nurse or by the patient, you know, I've had 10 doses of these. Uh, they, I, you know, they're telling me I need another six. Can you order it? Sure, that sounds good. And you, you know, glad it's working, and not realizing that he just, you know, signed off on her on her uh, death warrant, so to speak, in terms of not not having a good outcome from all of this. 
Um, so, and he didn't know, like, I remember, I distinctly remember the discovery of him. He was a really nice doctor. Met, like, I don't think, I don't think he even realized, you know, what, you know, how that was going to play out. Um, he just thought he was renewing a prescription that was helping a patient and everything was in place in terms of what was going on. Damn, poor guy, huh? Well, I, this is one of those moments where um, the electronic health care, health records can step into the electronic medical record because, you know, pre-post gentamicin levels, peak trough levels, would this would have been a big red flag that popped up on a computer system. And um, hope, I mean, as long as someone paid attention to that and, you know, took on the responsibility of ordering it and monitoring it and adjusting the dose as needed. But it, that, this is some place where that could help. So that's the end of your lawsuits that you had to talk about today, but I have a couple other questions for you if you don't mind. Um, many malpractice lawsuits in my experience, and I think in everyone's experience, have a lot of overlapping issues. Of the five that we talked about in the beginning, which include communication, assessment, med errors, equipment errors, infection control, um, did you find that in these cases as well, that there are overlapping issues, not just one that contributed to these adverse outcomes? Oh, absolutely. I think I think there are often multiple issues that that come up in every case. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I could go back and think about it, but I think communication is often a big one. Um, you know, communication between physicians, between nurses and physicians, between nurses. Um, that that I think is in my uh, you know almost twenty years of experience in in prosecuting these cases. That is a common denominator is the, the breakdown in communication. Um, so someone, someone doing something or thinking something, um, and then the patient getting passed along, and there's some kind of breakdown in communication, and and the person receiving it, uh, receiving the patient uh, is kind of set up for failure in a way. Well, if I just think back to that last case, you know, the um, the lady that had the IV gentamicin in the community. Just the communication from hospital to home can be really something too, because you could order, even if all the right orders had been put out, like she needed to have these pre-post levels of, or pre-post gentamicin levels ordered, you know, there has to be even a bigger assessment of, does she have a car? Is she compliant? Can she, does she know how to drive? Can she get to the lab? You know, is she competent enough to go from point A to point B at a certain time? You know, every three days or whatever this could be, and be at the lab for two hours or three hours or whatever this, pre-post testing would take. So there's a lot of both assessment and communication to go. So that's interesting you brought that up because we'll be talking about that in the future. And I think communication is the big one and medication errors is probably the second biggest one. Uh, infre infrequency, maybe not necessarily in injury or damages, but infrequency. Just a general question like, as an outsider and a member of the legal profession, outside the healthcare profession, even though you talk a lot like a doctor most of the time, Paul, I gotta tell you, but outside the medical profession and, and the legal view, what what is your general view of medication errors? Yeah, I mean, I think they're scary, you know, as a potential consumer of, of healthcare services, I'm scared that um, I or my family member or anyone could, could have be a victim of a medication error. I also see them as the classic human mistake um, that um, we all make, right? Um, you know, it's it, you can see how it can easily happen. Um, I, you know, I I was um, in the hospital six weeks ago for the delivery of my 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 fourth baby, and um, congratulations! Thank you. And you know, I was you know, and, and every time in the hospital, I love it because it's sort of. You know, I see the, I see your world through medical records and experts. Basically, is how I see hospitals. Right? I read medical records, I do medical research, and then I talk to people in healthcare. But I'm not in the hospital. Like I don't spend time in hospitals or actually the practice of it. But I see, you know, how you know. In in this case, when I was in the hospital, I saw how busy the nurses were. They're running around, they're changing diapers, they're swaddling babies, they're dealing with you know new moms who are upset and you know worried and. They're checking, you know, bandages for, you know, scars and, you know, they're really busy. 
And, you know, and everyone's got their medications. I mean, it wasn't super complicated in terms of what people were getting. Like you talk about people who have a bunch of comorbidities and they're in the ICU and they have 17 different drugs and like that's really complicated. But even even at what you're dealing with, you have all these things and, you know, could someone grab some medication from one patient and give it to the wrong one? 100%. You could totally see that happening. Um, and th- thank goodness that, you know, most of the time it would be pretty benign what would happen. But you you can see how easily it can happen, and it, you know it's very scary um, because you know we think of hospitals as safe places where we go to get better, not as places where we go and we could potentially get killed by someone's mistake. Well, thanks both for your um, understanding of the issues, but your compassion for the you know the people who are giving the medications in hospital. It is really busy, and it just takes a second of inattention, not to you know explain or excuse but to help understand perhaps just how it happens. It's just that the potential risks are so high. So a uh, bigger question even, in your mind and in your opinion, how, how do we fix this problem, for lack of a better word, of medication errors? Or how do we educate professionals in a way or change systems in a way that they stop happening? No right or wrong answer here, Paul. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think I think the human side of it, so long as human beings are involved, there's going to be some kind of mistake. And I think I think the the solution is, you know, and, and one of the things being in the hospital again recently, I noticed how they had uh, barcode scanners and they'd scan, you know, your wristband and then they'd scan the device to take your temperature and then they'd scan, you know, and I was like, wow, that's really going to make a difference. And, you know, all they have to do is scan the package that has the drugs that's, you know, pre-packaged before they open it up and give it to you. And then, you know, hopefully, uh, so long as there's no packaging errors with the drugs or labeling errors or whatever, then no one should ever have a problem with getting the wrong drug. So long as a person does the scanning like they're supposed to. But again, what happens if they don't do the scan like they're supposed to, or they, or like you said, system override or whatever. I think so long as there's human beings involved, there's going to be problems. But I do think that with all the technology we have, that has got to have a significant, significant reduction in the amount of uh, medication errors. It's, it's got to. It just and it just it, you know makes sense that it would. Mm. Well, let's hope so. I, I hope that's true. So one last question for you. It's actually a three-part question, but it's one big question. Um, but because podcast listeners include lawyers, doctors, nurses, and the public, could you answer this question for each audience based on your experience and the stories you've shared with us today? Let's take them one at a time. In your view, what is the most important thing that doctors and nurses need to know about medical malpractice lawsuits that involve medication errors? You know, one of the things that I always would like to tell nurses and doctors, and I don't get to because I don't represent them. I'm always on the the wrong side of the table of of nurses and doctors unless they're doing consultations for me. And that is that it's, it's not personal, you know, from strictly from a legal perspective mistakes happen and it's best to just own up to them. You know, if, if a mistake happens, you know, what, what frustrates me as a lawyer is not that a mistake happened or someone gave the wrong drug to someone and someone had a bad outcome. What frustrates me is um, trying to get get away with it or trying to like say, oh, well, that person would have died anyways or they're old or, you know, that drug uh, that probably caused it didn't necessarily cause it, it's probably some other drug. You know, I think it's taking a, you know, responsibility and accountability for it because from the patient's perspective, by and large, is really just about getting some recognition of wrongdoing. It's about getting some closure to a bad event. And it's about getting compensation for losses that they've suffered. It's not, it's not about saying, you know, that's a bad doctor, or that's a bad nurse, and they should be punished. Um, and all the time I've done it, it's very rare that I have a vindictive or angry um, uh, patient, client, and a lot of the times they're just let down and they feel bad. And they just want some recognition. And what makes it worse is, you know, the the overly vigorous defense. And I'm not saying that doctors and nurses shouldn't be defended. They absolutely should be defended just like anybody else should. But at the end of the day, I think having a more pragmatic and holistic approach to things and saying, hey, you know what, something went wrong here. And let's try to, you know, fix the, the broken person, broke, fix a broken system. And let's not, you know, dwell on the mistakes that people made and just say, you know, mistakes happen and let's move on. Mm, good answer. Good answer, Paul. What about to um, other lawyers who are litigating medication or cases? It sounds like you've done a few. Any advice for them? Yeah, I mean, I think I think be careful and don't just assume that 
because there was a medication administration error that, you know, necessarily it's going to be a, you know, walk in the park in terms of getting compensation for your client, uh, kind of part and parcel to my previous answer. They do, you know, fight these cases and it's not, you know, just the nurses and, and, and doctors, it's their insurance companies or their, you know, defense associations or whatever it may be, they'll defend the cases. And if at the end of the day, it was one of those cases where there was, um, you know, a problem with the drug being administered when it shouldn't have been, but the harm isn't really all there. Um, yeah, those are going to be hard cases and they're, they're going to fight and uh, it might not be economical and it might be uh, uh, challenging. So be prepared that when you do take on these cases, you may need to re retain all the right experts, the right doctors, nurses, pharmacologists, whatever you might need to prove the case um, because it doesn't, you know, just because it happened doesn't necessarily translate into a viable lawsuit. Mm, yeah, good one. And what about to the general public? What would you like to know, like them to know about the malpractice lawsuits that are based on a medication error? Probably, probably that you're better off not having to ever contact a lawyer for medical. <laughs> yes. You know, the best thing is, you know, to be vigilant. Like you said at the beginning, um, you know, people don't assume, don't assume that, you know, just because someone's giving you a drug in the hospital, that it's the right drug. And you don't want to be questioning and challenging your doctors and nurses all the time and being a pain in the butt to them because that's not good either. But I think I think you need to be alive to the fact that, you know, like, well, what is this and what's this for and why am I taking it? What's that drug called? I mean, we all have phones on us, basically walking encyclopedias. Look it up. You're in the hospital. You're not doing anything anyways. Read about the drugs you're taking. Learn a little bit more about them. You know, it, it's, you know, it's something you can do yourself. And who knows? It might prevent something bad from happening. Um and, you know, you know, we, we say, you know, hospitals are dangerous places. They're not terribly dangerous, but, you know, you, you do have to be concerned and, and pay attention. So that's what I'd say to, to patients is just pay attention. Look at what you're doing. And I think that's all you can really do. Mm. Well, that's good. That's good. All good advice and all from your perspective. And I appreciate it, all of it. So thank you so much. So is there anything else you want to say, Paul? No, I don't think so, except thank you so much for having me. I mean, I've always enjoyed doing these things with you and it's been been a number of years and always a pleasure and so thank you again for involving me in your podcast and in the past for all your presentations and, and everything i really appreciate it oh well you're so welcome and thank you the thanks is all to you this has been a great podcast so let's that let's wrap this up um i think you know we've all heard some of the scary stuff about medication errors and what a big problem it is but i want to leave everyone with a little perhaps reassurance and advice for improvement from the CPSI to healthcare organizations, the advice is healthcare organizations can support and provide an environment where healthcare professionals, staff, patients, and families feel safe to report and discuss medications, adverse events, or systems failures, and embrace them as opportunities to learn and improve. Patient safety requires quality data, which is more likely to be produced in an environment where staff and patients feel safe to report and discuss adverse events and shortcomings in system safeguards. So basically that's just, you know, cause that isn't, I would say that isn't always true. There's an element of dread and potential going to get in trouble, going to lose my job, or certainly in the case of Redonda Vat in the nursing world, there's, you know, a criminal charge related to that. So all, all, all there are barriers and not always a feeling of safety to reporting. For healthcare professionals from the US Pharmacist website, to maintain patient safety and avoid medication errors, it's important that pharmacists, nurses, and all healthcare professionals adhere to the standard for safe medication practices known as the five rights, but now we know there are 10, and to always be sure it's the right patient, drug, dose, time, and route. For the public, the Consumer Clinic from the Mayo Clinic website says, one of the best ways to reduce your personal risk of a medication error is to take an active role in your own healthcare. Learn about the medications you take, including the possible side effects. Never ever has hesitate to ask questions or share concerns with your doctor, pharmacist, nurse, or other healthcare providers. That's very close to what you just said, Paul. So look at you, hand in hand with the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to say thank you not only to Paul, but for all of you who are listening in. I think one of the bigger takeaways, as in the last podcast on assessment, is to remain vigilant, to stay diligent, 
and never, ever get complacent. Not patients, not doctors, not nurses, not pharmacists, not hospitals, not anybody. So thanks again to all of you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget that in many jurisdictions, nurses, doctors, and lawyers can claim continuing education for listening. The podcast is now available on all the usual platforms. And for nurses in the U.S., you can listen and receive credit on CE Broker by searching for Connect Medical Legal Education. So be sure to tune in too over the next few months as we break down the issues of communication, the big one, equipment errors, and infection control. Goodbye and take good care. Thank you.